Hello, everybody. This is Secular Sekai with Tridents Against... Oh, there might have been a slight delay. Hello, everybody. This is Secular Sekai with Tridents Against Tyrants. And look, I remembered to press both of the buttons, and it went live properly today. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so, it has been a very busy week, as it always is, and we've got quite a bit of news to cover so let's see i see n hill cf beauty uh dumitru kk's gg amonski amarski holy oblation uh silver earth anton is here with us in chat hey anton um and if possible i think that's everyone i see so far so welcome everybody um and it looks like you guys can hear me, so <coughs> very good. <coughs> I still have the cough from hell, <coughs> so uh, if it ever ends up killing me, you guys will be the first to know. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, uh, what have we got here? Okay, first and foremost, we're going to go ahead and just jump into the news a little bit. Uh, I've got quite a few things I want to announce, so I mentioned, I believe, in one of my most recent community posts on fundraiser updates. Uh, I got a few things I want to show you guys this week. And some of you might have actually already seen these if you um, saw me on the most recent stream with Rick. Uh, oh, and I see here a reminder about Q&A. I'm putting it up right now. Thank you very much. Boom. Back to chat. Uh, shoot, I lost my train of thought. Where was I? Oh, um, yeah, anyway, uh, so I'll turn the camera on in a little bit to show you guys some of the, you know, really, really great stuff that I got here recently from a few different friends of mine fellow activists, supporters, uh, supporters of Ukraine and Ukrainians themselves who work with, you know, supporting the armed forces and, and different nonprofit organizations. But first, for right now, let's jump right into the news. So, put this into reader mode. We've got a, <coughs> we've got quite a bit of, <coughs> great news that's been put together by um the wonderful cf beauty uh, who's been helping a little bit with uh organizing some of that um first article i've got is just uh i want to jump into it related to the title on this video uh regarding romania so let me pull it up right now oh also before that you may notice on the screen in front of you oh is there a neck Hold on. Is there an echo? Uh, if you guys can hear, sound is good. Oh, I need some, re oh, Ricola. I see the joke. <laughs> I, I get it. Uh, yeah. <coughs> I have Ricola. I've been taking a lot of Ricola. And it may not sound like it. My cough is better than it was before, but... Actually, I don't know if it's better or if I'm just so used to it that I forget I have it and I don't pay attention when I cough anymore. But it's one or the other, and I stopped caring about it. <laughs> anyway, um, real fast, before we continue, <clears throat> you'll notice that uh, the FPV drone fundraiser, we have an <coughs> update <coughs> here on the screen. Uh, so we were, we, we did have a few thousand trivna uh, in here, and that has been withdrawn. Anton went ahead and withdrew it, and he's getting ready to purchase a few more drones to send to the 110th Mechanized Brigade. So that's been subtracted from the total amount we have left for the overall fundraiser goal. So our new number is 1,873,000 trivna to uh, finish financing the rest of the 110 FPV drones. If you would like to... Uh, assist with that 
I've got these pop-ups you can see here, the one for PayPal donations in the upper right. And if PayPal doesn't work for you, Anton's Buy Me a Coffee in the lower left should work for most people. <coughs> um, and then, of course, if it does work for you, Monobank, the, that link should be in the description of the video. And it's uh, uh, if that does work for you, is the most direct way to donate. Anyway, moving on. Here we go. And let's get it at the right size. And uh, is this going to be too many things on the screen popping up? <coughs> While we're covering the news, I'm just going to temporarily turn off one of these messes. I'll, I'll turn off the one about channel membership. I'll leave the one for PayPal donations up. All right, first piece of news. Oh, yeah, there was no echo. I think that uh, they were just making a joke. <coughs> because the Ricola commercials have the echo, like, Ricola. Uh, so it was a, a tongue-in-cheek joke about my cough. <laughs> All right, so... Romania could <coughs> soon deploy troops <coughs> to protect citizens abroad. Now, this uh, now I don't. Uh, th this title is a little bit clickbaity on this uh, video, and I apologize for that. I just needed to think of a good a good title that fit in with what I wanted to talk about today. <laughs> and um, so, I don't want people to misunderstand. To the best of my knowledge, this discussion has not been about Romanian troops going to Ukraine specifically. Rather, this has been a discussion about <coughs> whether or not Romanian troops in general uh, might be deployed abroad outside of Romanian borders for various different combat and non-combat uh, military operations. So a lot of people have been reading into this a bit because uh, as a part of NATO, and the EU, especially NATO. Obviously, Romania has deployed <coughs> troops abroad before as part of NATO, um, well, various different NATO military operations in the past. Um, not actually, I don't know the exact numbers. If I'm being honest, I'd have to look in, look that up. But they have deployed troops as part of the alliance in the past, and for various other. <coughs> international uh peacekeeping coalitions <coughs> a few uh un peacekeepers who they've contributed in the past etc like many other countries but uh what's important about this is it would be the romanian military directly sending troops abroad so most people are reading into this from what i understand uh actually you know what let's read the article first and then i'll give my commentary on this all right, so Romania could soon deploy troops to protect citizens abroad. Ro no. <coughs> Romania could soon deploy troops to safeguard Romanian citizens beyond its borders, according to draft provisions, which, if adopted, would amend the national defense law. The amendment proposal, which also addresses so-called hybrid threats, has been open to public debate and may be subject to changes once it reaches the parliament. I want everybody to remember this part right here that's mentioned in this article, hybrid threats, and it'll make it very clear why this is being mulled over to be passed um, within the Romanian government. If adopted, the new provisions would give Romania's president the power to order quote, necessary measures to protect Romanian citizens in danger beyond the country's borders. On a proposal from the Prime Minister, filling a gap as Romania currently lacks a mechanism for providing military protection to citizens abroad. However, the amendment bill does not specify whether provisions are to extend to dual nationals like Romanian Moldovan citizens. And that's the important part. That, that's another important part, too. I, I guess they're kind of touching upon it. Uh, 
more directly here. Um, a group that has grown significantly following the program initiated by <coughs> former Romanian President Traian, uh, Traian Basescu. Basescu. Over a million Moldovans may hold Romanian citizenship, Moldovan President Maya Sandu said last month, admitting she lacked official data to support her claim. The statistics are held by Romanian institutions. I've heard a figure of one million, Sandu said in an interview with Digit24 television channel. The amendment also addresses the issue of countering hybrid threats, a first for Romanian legislation. Parliament may authorize the deployment of military or non-military resources inside or outside the territory of Romania to counter hybrid threats, following a proposal by the President and in consultation with the uh, country's Supreme Defense Council, the bill states. The bill also proposes the creation of a new uh, body, the National Military Command Center, or CNMC, to coordinate and manage all defense forces, including NATO troops stationed in Romania. It also emphasizes the importance <coughs> of integration and cooperation between the Romanian armed forces and those of NATO and the European Union. So, a lot to unpack here, and obviously this is just one <coughs> short article. There's a lot more reading, a lot more politics going into this than what can be, you know, fit into this one article. Uh, which, by the way, I almost forgot to put into the chat, so I'm doing that now so you all can read along and check it out. Uh, yourselves if you desire to do so. Um, so the big takeaway from this is, uh, it is, I don't want people to think that this is a, like Romanian and therefore Romania is part of NATO, NATO troops being sent to Ukraine. That's not really the emphasis here. Rather, uh, this is, this is looking toward the wars of tomorrow, everybody. This is looking toward Moldova. This is looking toward Republic of Georgia. This is looking toward Armenia. These, this is looking toward the most likely places where war will break out again in the future, 10 years, 20 years from now. Uh, and, uh, of course, the emphasis here being specifically um, on Moldova is what is implied. Now, the reason for this being Moldova and Romania both used to be um, together as one nation, um, the territory of Moldova, the country of Moldova, was basically taken by the Soviets. Um, uh, basically, Romania was told, "Hey, give us a, this huge portion of your territory, or we're we're gonna, or or we're gonna come and we're going to uh, cause a lot of problems and a lot of death and destruction." Uh, and take even more territory. So uh, basically, a while back after World War II, the uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the Romanian yeah after World War II, the Romanian government acquiesced and and gave that territory to Russia. Um, and of course, eventually, uh, with the the end of the Soviet Union, the breakup of the USSR, um, Moldova, like many other places. Uh, now has its independence. Oh, is the PayPal address bar too hard to read? Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Thanks for the note on that. Yeah, the blue, the blue part is uh, pretty readable, but not the, uh, the actual email address. Okay, I'll be sure to update that. Thank you. Uh, and for anyone who can't read it, it's... Uh, well, it'll pop up again here in a sec, but the email... Oh, here it is. The email is tonytkachenko27 at gmail.com for anyone who wants to do PayPal donations to assist the FPV drone fundraiser for the 110th Mechanized Brigade of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. Yeah, it is also a little small. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll switch it over and use the other one that's bigger specifically for PayPal donations, and I'll make... Actually, I'll probably just change the design up altogether so that everything is more readable. But you guys can read the uh, Buy Me a Coffee pretty well, right? In the lower left. Like, that's not too small. I hope it's not too small. It might depend on what screen you're looking at, if it's a computer or a phone. In any case, back to this. The implication here is that... Uh, 
the Romanian armed forces are sending a statement to Russia um, that they will not tolerate hybrid warfare and political destabilization in their backyard, so to speak, within Moldova. Uh, we all, many people are uh, probably aware of the issue with Transnistria, the breakaway republic of Moldova, uh, the large Romanian-speaking population of Moldova, uh, because many Moldovans are ethnically Romanian, um, and uh, the language is essentially the same, although depending on who you talk to, some Moldovans may get upset if you say that, uh, but even the government of Moldova uh, has a certain <coughs> degree of recognition of Moldovan language being uh, interchangeable or practically the same as Romanian language, basically the same language. So um, basically there's close ties between the two. Um, but Russia has also made it very clear that any territory that at one point or another doesn't it doesn't matter guys. It, it can be the baltics and nato it can be moldova which they the soviet union took basically bullied romania into giving up it can be ukraine any of the other uh ex-soviet countries well maybe not any of them but uh for lack of a better word any of them that uh muscovia any of them that uh Russian leadership in Moscow would see as uh, beneficial to assimilate. Uh, all of that is stuff that Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin have their eyes on. Moldova is no exception. And so uh, my, the way I see this is Romania is trying to make a clear statement with or without NATO, just like how if you do too many things that upset Turkey, Turkey has made it clear with or without NATO if Russia steps on Turkey's toes too much, Turkey's going to step on Russia's toes. If Russia steps on Romania's toes too much, then Romania will step on Russia's toes, will tit for tat. So um, we'll see how this goes and if it's just political posturing or if there's actual teeth to this. But in my opinion, it it looks like something that is a positive development. Oh, and I see we have a donation. Uh, <coughs> I did not see a buy me a coffee notification. Uh, so this either would have been PayPal or Monobank directly, but ooh, someone just gave 2000 Hrivna. So thank you very much. That is greatly appreciated. And so that's about, that's about 50, Fifty-one dollars, a little more than fifty-one U.S. dollars. So, thank you very much. All right. Ooh, and N Hill recently put a uh, a link for a list of companies that have left Russia. So that's important. Yeah, pay attention to what companies um, you do or don't support. Everybody, I, for example, don't go to Burger King because they. I, I love Burger King. I grew up eating a lot of Burger King as a child. Um, and I don't eat it because they still do business in Russia, which, which really pisses me off at the seat, current CEO of Burger King. <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, and Catalan T. Catalan is here. Catalan T is here. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, uh, I don't want to provide any information that someone doesn't uh, give me permission to provide but but he he says here in his comment pretty clearly exactly right we've dealt with russia's crap for far too long and we've had it and yes romanian and moldova's language are practically the same very small differences uh, so yeah exactly um cannot agree with you more right there catlin all right all right now on to the next piece of news so let me pull it up We'll start with a recap from the Institute for the Study of War. Oh, wow. This is a formal recap. 
So we probably won't go through the whole thing, but I do want to touch on highlights. Do I need reader mode for this? Let me see. No, I think it's per I think it's fine. <coughs> Either way, I don't think the Institute for the Study of War is going to throw a fit. Um, so let me switch this over. And <coughs> I'll put the link in the chat for everybody. And welcome everybody who is recently joining us. How does this look? Let's see. Oh, maybe I do want reader mode. Yeah, for some reason that is... Oh. Oh, it's just because of the way that the browser page loads. Okay, that works. <clears throat> so, from the Institute for the Study of War, this is a formal assessment. And uh, if you check the link I put in the chat, then you can come and look at this yourself if you have an academic interest or, or just personal interest um, uh, in looking over this documentation. Uh, Russian Offensive Campaign Assessment for April 5th of 2024. Authors are Angelica Evans, Riley Bailey, Christina Harward, Grace Maps, and George Barro, uh, Barros. So, ooh. There's also an interactive map from the ISW for anyone unfamiliar uh, to see <coughs> what the current <coughs> situation on the ground is with uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the illegal <coughs> invasion of Ukraine. Uh, 3D control of terrain topographic map. Oh, wow. I'm kind of tempted to take a look at some of these uh, on stream. Uh, archive of interactive time-lapse maps of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. This one's very important. Okay, and Deep State Map also technically does have this because you can go back and forth and see time-lapse of everything since the beginning of the invasion. It, and also territories outside of Ukraine that are also indirectly involved in this conflict or the possibility of future conflict. So anyway, ISW, like Deep State, has pretty good... <coughs> Pretty good information, pretty good maps. All right. Ukraine Security Service, SBU, and Ukrainian forces reportedly conducted one of the largest series of drone attacks, uh, uh, sorry, drone strikes against military facilities within Russia, targeting at least four Russian air bases on the night of April 4th to the 5th. Ukrainian media reported that sources within Ukrainian security services, including the Ukrainian Main Military Intelligence Directorate, or HUR, uh, yeah. And for anyone uh, confused, um, uh, because remember, there are both Ukrainian <coughs> and Russian-speaking citizens of Ukraine, so some pronounce it hurmo and some gur, like G-U-R, um, and it's just a difference in language, but that would be hur, hurmo in Ukrainian. Stated that the S... <coughs> BU and Ukrainian forces conducted successful strikes on airfields near Kursk City and Yeysk Krasnodar Krai, the Angles Air Base in Saratov Oblast, and the Morozovsk Air Base in Rostov Oblast. These Ukrainian security sources reportedly stated. Oh, wrong screen. That the Ukrainian drone strike significantly damaged three Tu 95 MS strategic bombers at Angles Air Base, damaged two Su uh, Su 25 fixed wing aircraft at the airbase near Yeysk, and destroyed six unidentified aircraft, and significantly damaged another eight unidentified aircraft at the Morozovsk Air Base. The Ukrainian strikes reportedly killed four Russian military personnel at the airbase air base near Yeysk and seven Russian personnel at the Angles Air Base and wounded and killed up to 20 Russian personnel at the Morozovsk Air Base. Geolocated footage shows <coughs> explosions and Russian air defenses activating near all the air bases except for the one near Yeysk. ISW has not yet observed any visual confirmation that Ukrainian forces damaged or destroyed aircraft or infrastructure at any of the air bases. Satellite imagery collected on April 4th indicates that there were three T, uh, Tu-160 heavy strategic bombers, five Tu-95 strategic bombers, an 
um, II-76 transport aircraft and a uh, Tu-22 bomber at Angles Air Base. 10 L-39 aircraft uh, training and combat aircraft. 5 AN-26 transport aircraft and AN-74 transport aircraft and AN-12 transport aircraft. A lot of transport aircraft. 4 Su-27 fixed wing aircraft. 4 Su-25 fixed wing aircraft and 1 Su-30 fixed wing aircraft. And several KA-52... <laughs> There are so many different aircraft that were affected in this. Um, I want to tell this author they they they're, they're making very liberal use of their commas and their ands in this report. <laughs> anyway, so we we get the point that uh, many different aircraft were uh, damaged in recent attacks by the Ukrainian armed forces, which is good news. Uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense claimed that Russian forces intercepted 44 drones over Rostov Oblast, six drones over Krasnodar Krai, and a drone each in Saratov, Kursk, and Belgorod Oblasts on the night of April 4th and into the morning on April 5th. Ukrainian drone strikes have typically only targeted individual air bases within Russia. <coughs> And Ukraine's ability to strike four separate air bases in one strike series represents a notable inflection in the capabilities that Ukrainian forces are employing in their campaign against Russian military infrastructure, critical infrastructure, and strategic industries within Russia. Now, as I said before, this is a very long, very dense, formal assessment of <coughs> what's currently happening on the ground uh, in some of the hotter combat zones broken down by region all across Ukraine. Uh, it talks about Ukrainian successes. It talks about advancements by the enemy into Ukrainian territory, uh, successful repelling in various other areas by the Ukrainian armed forces. So there's a lot to un <coughs> unpack and analyze here. Uh, for anyone who is interested in all of this, definitely check out the link in the description. But we're going to go ahead and move on just because I don't want to sit here and uh, be reading all of this report to you guys for what time we have left on the stream. <laughs> all right. Ah, uh, Ilutin. I-L. Is that, so wait, it was an I-L? Ah, uh, uh, yeah, for one of the aircraft I was reading. If so, then, yeah, that would make sense. They, uh, personally, I think they should have just capitalized the second L. <laughs> uh, <coughs> anyway, on to the next piece of news. There we go. Come on. Oh, hold up. Sorry, my computer's being a little slow. There we go. <clears throat> From Euromaidan Press, putting this into the chat. Frontline report. Ukraine repels Russian assault waves in the strategic city of Krasnohorivka, Donetsk Oblast. And we got another donation, <coughs> which I'm guessing is probably PayPal, either that or directly through Monobank. And we're now at 4,000 to... Oh, and we got another one. We went from 4,209 to 5,229.63 hryvna. Thank you very much uh, to everyone who's donated. Greatly appreciated. What I need to do, hold on, let me see, let me check something real fast. And I really wish <coughs> that PayPal weren't being the way they are about Ukrainian accounts, because when you guys make a donation through PayPal, or... Uh, or through Monobank, it goes directly to Anton, who then, of course, gets it directly where it needs to go uh, in order to get 
the drones physically into the hands of soldiers. But unfortunately, um, actually, there might be a way. <coughs> there might be a way to do it with Monobank, but since Monobank is hit or miss on whether it works or not, I haven't really looked into that. But with PayPal, it would be extremely helpful if it were possible to have pop-up alerts. The problem is that, to the best of my knowledge, PayPal isn't allowing that for Ukrainian accounts, so it's very annoying. And we and you want it to go directly to Ukrainian accounts because um, if it goes to a non-Ukrainian account and then you have to transfer to someone, you're you're still paying the extra fee. Uh, anyway. Uh. Okay. Well, let me see if this works. Because uh, <coughs> it may or may not. But to everybody who has uh, donated so far, uh, let me actually hold on. Let me make sure I've got volume at a decent level so it isn't blowing people's ears out. Oh, <laughs> actually, that might not have played for you guys. Did anyone hear applause just now? If not, then I'll have to fix that for the next stream. Um, but yeah, that that's another thing I like about this uh, tool I've got now. Um, yeah, Monobank does charge a percent outside of Ukraine. That's true. I think it's, I don't think it's a huge percent, but that is true. You, you are correct about that. <coughs> Um, yeah, one thing that's nice is having things like, uh, preloaded sound effects. No? Damn. Okay. Well, I haven't, I haven't had a reason to use them, so I haven't, you know, set them up, but I'll make sure those are working next time. Anyway, pretend that you heard applause and thank you everyone who donated. All right, let's get on to this news. <clears throat> from April 4th, day 771. On April 4th, there are a lot of developments in the Kurakove direction. Here, Russians have increased the intensity of their attacks toward the Ukrainian town of Kurakove and have started a, <clears throat> a large-scale battle in an attempt to reach it. Oh. Huh. <laughs> I like, I really like this, um, for anyone who is familiar, actually, I don't think I've actually mentioned it yet. No, no, well, I'm sure I have at least once, but Reporting from Ukraine is a YouTube channel, and I, I just like the fact that Euromaidan Press actually pulls a screenshot from Reporting from Ukraine. That's, that's a nice little touch. Um, after taking Marinka, the next logical step for Russians became Krasnohorivka, as the settlement plays a key role in their offensive eastward for two important reasons. Wait. Uh, I think that's a typo, because they're in the east. They're moving westward. Anyway, uh, for two important reasons. First is that Krasnohorivka is... Oh, sorry is of long-term strategic importance to Ukrainians, as it is a staging ground for possible future counterattacks on Russian-held settlements and eventually into the city of Donetsk itself. Second is that, besides allowing Russians to consolidate their gains by taking away the Ukrainian threat, Krasnohorivka is of major tactical value to Russians, as taking the town would allow them to push forward into the fields, partially cutting off supply to the Ukrainian fortress settlements further along the line behind Marinka, and providing fire control into the Ukrainian flanks. Through this, Russians will try to alleviate the difficulty of attacking these settlements by simultaneously attacking the Ukrainians from the flanks. So, as you can see here, this is what's being done to repel the uh, invaders, the Muscovites. <clears throat> and they're kind of pushing westward, or northwestward, you can kind of see. Uh, and attempting to slowly and eventually surround the city. And if they take Krasnohorivka, that gives them a 
strategic and tactical advantage to then push forward onto other fortress cities in the area. So, yeah, um, like just like with Avdivka, um, the Russian focus is attrition, death by a million cuts, and uh, just attack, 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 doesn't matter what kind of losses they have. But here's the thing, guys. If Ukraine doesn't have the equipment it needs and doesn't get some more ammo and artillery soon, um, you know, Russian losses and everything we've been hearing for months, for, for two years now, about how high, how costly the fighting is for the Russians, it's not going to be as costly if there isn't ammunition for Ukrainians to make them pay for invading territory. So, yeah, keep pushing, keep talking. <coughs> we got to do more than just talk. Talk to your congressman. If there is a local office for your representatives and there are people in your area who care about Ukraine, start talking to them. Start seeing what you can do to organize uh, protests. If people are part of groups that support Ukraine, but they are afraid to get too political because my nonprofit 501c3 status could be put in jeopardy or et cetera, et cetera. Teach them about 501c4s. Teach them how you can organize and do this stuff and, you know, basically put a little bit of a shield up to protect yourself if people are concerned about stuff like that. We got to get people out and we got to get cameras on people. We got to let the world know, Canada, the U.S., the world as a whole, see that people care and they're doing more than just talking. They're acting. Actions speak louder than words. And, and again, so for you being here, staying up to date with the news and especially to anyone who's donated, uh, thank you for taking action and you are very appreciated, every last one of you. Now then, assaulting Krasnohorivka is not an easy task for Russians for multiple reasons. Firstly, Krasnohorivka has been a frontline town since the war started in 2014. As such, Ukrainians have entrenched their positions here and are well prepared for Russian assaults. Secondly, Russians control only two attack vectors in the settlement, so Ukrainians have a relatively steady and safe line to supply and reinforce their forces. Thirdly, if we look at the topographic map, Excuse me. We can see that in attacking from the south, Russians have to deal with a slight uh, valley where the local river has turned into a swamp, forcing Russian armed assault groups to stick to a singular crossing point, which Ukrainians can easily monitor and contain with drones, artillery, mines, and ATGM teams. Furthermore, the rivers and swamps surrounding Krasnohorivka create a funnel for the Russian armed murder assaults, making them predictable and, <coughs> and manageable for the Ukrainian defenders. Now, this is actually great. This is <coughs> very useful because it also provides us a bit of a frontline update pretty early on in the news itself. Lastly, Ukrainians control a strong fortified position between Krasnohorivka and Heorivka, and a defensive line uh, behind the lakes complicating any Russian attempt to undercut the town and take it into a pocket. The Ukrainian defensive operation in Krasnohorivka is centered around the industrial district and the high-rise buildings behind it. From there, Ukrainians can overlook the entire settlement and efficiently coordinate their defense, as well as the many windows and other openings offering many firing positions for Ukrainians. All uh, right, yeah, yeah. And that's, well, I was actually going to make a comparison to another conflict, but basically urban areas, high-rise buildings can be, it, you can take great advantage of <coughs> tightly compacted uh, urban areas um, to get the high ground, to get proper firing positions, to set up uh, small special forces teams who really put fear into your enemy um, when they're just blindly sending infantry into patrol streets. There's a lot that can be done in that situation. The danger is what we've seen time and time again with, when it comes to the Russians. Uh, they just don't care. If they have to, they'll 
they'll bomb a city until it's literally nothing but rubble and there is no cover there is no high ground left um and only a few places in ukraine have mountains so not a lot of natural terrain to get that kind of advantage Russians understood the importance of this district and used artillery, tanks, and airstrikes with FAB 1500 bombs to devastate suspected Ukrainian firing positions and observation posts in preparation for the Russian assaults. Russians have been preparing for this assault and concentrating their forces in the area for over a month. While localized positional fighting offered the Russians a little success, the bombing of Ukrainian positions only intensified. And here you can see Krasnohorivka and... Uh, map of different locations that were bombed by the Muscovites in their assaults. After the Russian forces felt confident in the success of a larger storming operation of the settlement itself, they launched three assault waves on the town. The first assault came early in the morning, but did not manage to come even close to the settlement because, as it turned out, Ukrainians had mined the approaches, which is very good. That's exactly what we need to see. Uh, Ukraine not just planning for offensive operations but but making it hell for the russians when they're fighting on in a defensive posture ukrainian soldiers in the area stated that the russian assault group did not even manage to dismount their infantry infantry before being destroyed however the second and third assault waves did manage to break through and dismount their infantry which then made their way into the settlement from the south as the heavy fighting continued throughout the morning, Russian forces forced out the local Ukrainian garrison in the southern district of houses. Still, they could not cross the railway line into the next. So here you can see they did manage to get in. They got a foothold in the south, but then were held off. Russian forces then decided to dig in and fortify themselves in the newly acquired positions. As soon as Russians launched their first assault wave, Ukrainian defenders in Krasnohorivka called in quick reaction forces, which at that point were desperately needed to push the Russians out of their newly acquired bridgehead. So here you can see reinforcements coming. These quick reaction forces consisted of the 1st and 2nd battalions of the now famous 3rd Assault Brigade. Shout out to the 3rd Assault Brigade. A lot of history behind that particular brigade, and uh, I want to remind everyone that both Rick the Ukrainian and Yulia, if you're not subscribed to their channels already, go subscribe to them, uh, have done fundraisers and uh, no, yeah, no people who uh, have served in the 3rd Separate Assault Brigade. Um, and they do great work. They are special forces. Um, and uh, many of their soldiers have links to other groups such as Azov and Kraken, other special forces units within the Ukrainian Armed Forces. Most important of all, we are fundraising, as you can see on the screen with the progress bar, for the 110th Mechanized Brigade of the Ukrainian Armed Forces and the 3rd Separate Assault Brigade during the evacuation of Avdivka were instrumental in helping to save lives of the 110th and various other units of the Ukrainian Armed Forces who were stationed there. So big respect to the 3rd Assault Brigade. These soldiers are specially trained and equipped with high quality equipment to deal with the most difficult situations. The 3rd, uh, the 3rd Assault Brigade later shared footage of their counterattack operation in Krasnohorivka. The video shows the skill of these soldiers as they move through the houses and engage the Russians with small arms fire, grenades, tanks, and FPV drones. The video also shows the lack of coordination between the Russian assault group and their command as Ukrainians openly listen in to unsecured Russian radio uh, communications and Russian mortar and artillery support accidentally opened fire on Russian positions. After an intense battle, the Ukrainian forces dislodged the Russian fighters and returned the front line to its original position. A Ukrainian fighter in the area also stated that even though they were on the offensive and had to storm fortified Russian positions, Russian losses were three times higher than the Ukrainian. He, had, uh, he attributed this to their higher quality equipment and rapid casualty evacuation, leading to all of their wounded making it out alive while the entire Russian assault group was eliminated. 
Overall, Russian geolocated footage confirms that Ukrainians have retaken the southern district and forced the Russians out of the town, as Russians have resumed their shelling of the outer area of Krasnohorivka. So, very good news. Oh, hey, James is here, and so, are, so is Lauren, Cheryl, uh, and Mark, <coughs> Sangamon, uh, Mary M. Welcome to everybody who is joining the stream right now. Uh, where was I? Oh, here we go. Newly appointed commander-in-chief of <coughs> the Ukrainian Armed Forces, Oleksandr Sirsky, recently visited <coughs> the headquarters of the Avdivka Kurekove Front. He met with multiple commanders to discuss the defensive operation <coughs> in detail and to ensure that everything is organized and in place for Ukrainians to resist the next phase of the Russian offensive. This is crucial, guys, because remember, maybe something will happen, maybe someone can pull a rabbit out of their hat, but we are still looking at months, probably at least half a year, longer even, before more major support from the U.S. is able to make it to Ukraine. Um, maybe there will be a few small packages. Maybe something can actually be done and someone can convince Mike Johnson to actually put the vote up and then MAGA Republicans can throw their fit and remove him from office. Um, because that's that, that would probably be the logical series of events if that happens. But... Um, until we see something like that happen, uh, Europe, European Union and NATO, uh, member countries in Europe, you know, really got to step it up and provide Ukraine everything that they can. And American politicians, American supporters of Ukraine, um, really just got to keep the pressure up and got to, guys, got to keep pushing for U.S. Congress to pass aid for Ukraine. And most importantly, I know a lot of you don't like to hear this, but it's important for Ukraine. Any, I, look, anyone who is solidly and proven to be pro-Ukraine in American politics, they got to be pushed to win their elections come November. Because there are a lot of anti-Ukrainian politicians and groups in the U.S., really just anti, um, well, you know, quote unquote globalism or, or you know, they're, they're, they're more z a little xenophobic, isolationist, some of these groups and particular uh, politicians, individuals within the U.S. political uh, um, landscape. And... After November, if we don't see a lot of those people removed from office and a lot more who are supportive of NATO, supportive of the uh, U.S. and the EU having strong relations, supportive of uh, the U.S. providing aid to Ukraine, direct aid, military aid in the billions of dollars, uh, it's, it's going to be rough in 2025. So if you're an American, keep that in mind and please be involved in your political process. All right. Now then, uh, so that uh, pretty much covers this. Uh, this was a very good report, um, actually. So on to the next piece of news. Um, but first, let me go ahead and check <clears throat> Q&A. Let me open up my Discord because I'm sure I've got messages that... Um, I'm so busy I'm not noticing, and my phone is dead because I'm constantly running everywhere um, and busy. Yeah, no, we're good for right now. Okay, next piece of news, but first, really quickly, hold on. All right, I'm going to turn the camera on for one sec. Hold on, because I've got some really cool stuff that I want to show you guys. One sec.
Okay. Let me turn this on. All right. So, sorry if my voice is a little muffled, because I don't know where my good mask is, so I'm just wearing a throwaway mask. Anyway. All right. So we're going to do Q&A in one sec. Uh, but first, I just wanted to share a couple of really great things that I got um, here in the last week. I already showed some of these on uh, Rick's stream, Rick the Ukrainian, um, last week. But I wanted to show everybody over here so all tridents can see it. Um, I got several pieces of mail um, from Rick. Hold on, let me organize all this stuff. This is from Rick. This is from Rick. This is from... I got things from a lot of different people. So now I'm having to make sure I don't mix up what came from who. Uh, this. This. Okay. So first and foremost, I've got here something that I got from uh, 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 Voices for Ukraine, uh, Lila Trokometz, Trokometz and, uh, her, and Roman, their uh, uh, YouTube channel. Um, this is, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see it very well, because I need a better camera. Uh, that's going to be the next thing I purchase. Uh, but let me see if I can get good lighting on it. Ew, no, the lighting is just horrible in here. Well, in any case, oh, there we go. Kind of. I don't think you guys are going to be able to read it all, but I'll read it to you. So this is a bottle opener um, that was made from the remains of a Russian uh, Su-34 fighter jet known as RF-81259 Red-05. Um, <laughs> I need a secretary. That'd be nice. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I do have a lot of stuff I need to organize. Um, and what it reads is on the 28th of February, 2022, in the Battle of Kiev, the armed forces of Ukraine shot down the Russian Su-34, known as RF-81259 Red-05. And the remains of it were actually, um, were uh, Ukrainian civilians, uh, specifically um, Voices uh, for Ukraine. They were able to get their hands on some of the metal, and they made bottle openers to give to supporters of their channel a while back. So I signed up, I got this bottle opener, um, and one day I plan to go to Ukraine, use this to open a beer, and if I'm able to, I'm going to, when I'm finished, throw it across at the Muscovite side uh, of the border. And I hope that one day that Muscovite held territory side of the border is right back to where it should be, which is before 2014, before anything happened in Donbass, Crimea, and all of Ukraine is whole again. But regardless, I will be going to Ukraine one day and opening a Ukrainian beer with this bottle opener. Another thing I got was... Uh, multiple postcards I'll be using these for for something um, so some kind of a campaign but many of them are related to and have images of different members of the and drawings and paintings of different members of the Ukrainian armed forces so this is really nice to have Really appreciate receiving that. Um, from Rick, 
I got a couple of uh, postage stamps with a cheese grater in the shape of, I believe those are supposed to be F-16s. Um, and then the Kremlin being grated across them into a bowl. Postcard with <coughs> the famous statue in Cave. says Nadia in Ukrainian and uh, it reads Dear Sekai, thank you for all the continued support for Ukraine and my channel I'm proud to have such a roller in our community and a friend with people like you on our side we have no chance to lose with respect, Rick and big thank you to Rick the Ukrainian um, I was really happy when I received that put a smile on my face and last thing I'm going to share with you guys <coughs> with you guys and then we're gonna get back to the news so I'm not just sitting here doing show and tell uh let's see oh and here's the uh letter I received from uh Voices for Ukraine thank you for being a long term supporter of Ukraine and in particular also being a member of Voices for Ukraine. Your help is greatly appreciated. We look forward to meeting you in Kiev after the war. Also, let 2024 be a good year for all of us. Slava Ukraini. And specifically the reason why I'm showing you this is uh, the, the request on here is please show the Su-34 bottle opener trophy to many people and keep the conversation going about what's, hap <coughs> about what's happening in Ukraine. So, yeah. Um, everybody, to everyone you know, keep talking about Ukraine. All right, and now I'm going to take a step back because I've got two flags to show you. One sec. Okay, so this first flag that I received in the mail is <coughs> from Rick, and it's signed <coughs> by Rick, by Yulia, and by Halina, uh, which I greatly appreciate. Um, and, uh, well, I, uh, yeah, let me grab it real fast. I can't read what Halina wrote because it's in Ukrainian, so I'll need to brush up on my Ukrainian so I can actually read that. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Words of thanks from Yulia. Hello, dear sir. Thank you for your tireless work in supporting Ukraine and contributing to the info space. You rock. And of course, for all you do for me and Rick. Um, hugs, Yulia, to Secular Sekai. And thank you, Yulia. And hugs right back to you. And from Rick, dear Sekai, thank you for being one of the most dedicated freedom fighter, meaning one who fights for freedom against oppression. I, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I, I just consider myself a guy on the internet, but I do greatly appreciate that. And yeah, this is important stuff to speak out about. The real freedom fighters are the soldiers on the front lines. I want to make that very clear. Um, thank you for being among... The core rollers. I'm proud to call you my friend. With love, Rick. And right back at you, man. Right back at you. Thank you, Rick. All right. And then the very last thing before we go back to Q&A and then the news, everybody. I've got one more flag that I also received in the mail.
And of course, the quality of this camera, I, I don't think you guys can probably see it very well. But this was from Anton, and it has written on it, Tridents Against uh, Tyrants. Secular Sekai, Tridents, <coughs> Tridents Against Tyrants, War in Ukraine, 2014 to 2024. Thank you, my friend, for your support. Best regards, Anton Tukachenko. And I don't know if he's still here or not, but thank you, Anton. Thank you very much for the flag. I appreciate it, my friend. And uh, with it also came these two, which you should be able to see more easily. Patches. Both carrying the symbol of the 110th Mechanized Brigade, which appears to be a Cossack warrior on a black stallion with a spear. Okay, perfect. So it, it was visible. Awesome. And uh, on this patch, it says uh, in Ukrainian, 110th. OMBR, uh, 110th Mechanized Brigade, uh, in Cyrillic, and Pro Libertate, for freedom, for liberty, in Latin. So, thank you very much, Anton. Okay, and now I'm going to turn the camera off, and we're going to go back to our regularly scheduled programming. Actually, I'll turn it off in one sec first. Let's take a look at questions <clears throat> oh we have no questions yet so wait yep yep no questions yet so that makes my job easy <laughs> uh if you guys want to ask any questions feel free the q a uh section is open in youtube chat and let me double check discord And we do have two questions that <coughs> Enhill was kind enough to put here in the Discord. Thank you very much. Uh, from Holy Ablation, how many drones have been bought so far? Oh, for our initiative. Yes, so, so far, unless it's changed since Anton just withdrew um, the most recent amount, uh, we were waiting until we <coughs> could get several drones before making the next purchase. Uh, where we were at last time, I believe we were still at 16 for a while. Because when we first started, we were getting a lot of boosts and uh, additional assistance from Rollers and from Rick's community. But of course, this is a really big fundraiser we're doing, guys. <coughs> and it's not really fair to ask, um, you know, uh, ro Rollers to be financing you know fundraising the whole thing it all goes to the ukrainian armed forces but but rick helps a lot of people so you know he's got other fundraisers that he's working on um so we got the first couple pretty quickly right now after withdrawing the recent funds that was enough to get three more so we went from 16 out of 110 we're now at 19 out of 110 and as the channel grows and we get more people involved more attention I think we can get that to grow a lot faster. But also, uh, this is a pretty <coughs> ambitious fundraising initiative for a small channel. Like, maybe a few hundred or a few thousand or even 10,000 would be, like, like a bite-sized chunk of a fundraiser. Uh, but let's see, how much do we still have? When we first started this fundraiser... The total amount was <coughs> 50 something thousand US dollars for 110 FPV drones, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see how much we have left that we need to. I'll need to go back and look at uh, uh, paperwork to get the exact number for everybody. But right now we have 1,873,000 left. And that in US dollars is. 
$48,298.32. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> it, it's a lot, guys. But we're going to keep going. Um, we'll, and every, every week, every week, we're going to do everything we can. We're going to see about getting these drones. This is our long-term fundraiser, <coughs> fundraiser initiative. And uh, we, we may also take on a few smaller ones. I do want to. Uh, for example, actually, let me do a poll. Because I want us to <coughs> finish fundraisers and have something that we can actually say, hey, this is completed and this is done and here's a pictures and videos and update of stuff and and it doesn't take quite as many weeks in order to, to get those updates. So one thing I've considered doing is uh, another small fundraiser every once in a while to do with some of the med kits that Halina, Rick's friend, uh, puts together. Um, and I think that would be like somewhere between 300 and 600 dollars so you know we we usually manage a few hundred per stream so we, we could finish one of those in one or two one or two uh streams pretty pretty quickly probably so yeah let me put a poll up Okay. I probably should have worded that better instead of just making it a yes or no poll, but I was in a hurry. Anyway, yeah, because because that now that I think about now that I think about it, making it a yes or no poll, it's like, uh, <coughs> it, it would be really weird for people to say no to that. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's an idea. Aussie bug up. Let me uh, raffle flags and patches maybe. Uh yeah, that could work. Um, right now, right now, we've already got another thing that we're doing, and in fact, oh, also, uh, relating to auctions from Rick's channel, uh, paintings are on their way out. If you're here, Henrik, yours is on its way. NCC, uh, it was a busy, busy week, so I'm gonna get yours sent out on Monday, and, uh, on Sunday, we should be seeing about the results of the next three paintings that'll be going out, everybody. Let's see. But yeah, uh, doing raffles and auctions, I actually do want to do that, similar to what um, Rick is doing. Uh, I think, um, I, I really want to support his auctions more first, though getting the word out and having people um, pay attention to that because um, I like I can do raffles and I can do auctions for small things but uh, I, I feel like the channel needs to grow a little bit more before we'll have enough people interested in taking part I mean we have a few people who would be interested but it would also depend on what I'm auctioning and I'm not physically in Ukraine so if I'm going to mail something out to someone, like, uh, I've got a few things that, like, personal items, things that I own that are from Ukraine, that are from soldiers, but I don't really want to auction those because those are, those were gifts to me, and that would be, um, yeah, I, I feel like that would be, uh, it wouldn't be a good thing to do. So, uh, it, it's easier... I think to support those who are already in Ukraine and actively meeting and speaking with and communicating with troops inside the country because they're able to actually get signed flags. They're able to get lighters. They're able to get, you know, bullet casings, uh, able to get, uh, different things that, 
belong to soldiers from the front lines that have emotional and historical meaning to them. Um, so yeah, like I, I want to support those kinds of initiatives. When I do raffles and auctions, I'll have to see what kind of things I would offer to people. Anyway. <laughs> kind of like asking, yeah, exactly. Like asking if we like puppies, yes or no. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I worded it like that <laughs> with the with the poll. <laughs> um, let's see. Really quickly, 19 drones is a huge amount of money. Let's keep going. It is. Yeah, guys. I mean, uh, I think these drones, these drones, they're five or six hundred a piece. And let's see. So yeah, that's like almost that's like uh, almost twelve grand right there. Eleven thousand four hundred bucks if there's six hundred a piece. Um, that's not that's not anything to scoff at, guys. Uh, and that's before we've made it to a thousand subscribers on this channel. Cause yeah, I mean, you guys are awesome, and we've got friends and allies uh, all around the world and in Ukraine. You know, small channels supporting big channels, big channels supporting small channels. But the point is, we're doing everything we can to get the word out to help Ukraine and get supplies to the armed forces. I've said this time and time again. There's two things, two major things that we can all be doing as supporters of Ukraine. One is the grassroots efforts that a lot of us are doing, like right here, getting thousands or for some of the bigger, bigger fundraisers, even millions of dollars and euros worth of equipment to soldiers and to hospitals, uh, organizations that are doing real work, helping civilians, injured civilians, evacuating civilians, etc. Um, so grassroots fundraising. The other is um, political pressure in order to get our governments to give the billions of dollars and euros and other currencies that none of us have. Um, we, we'll fill the gap as much as we can, but at the end of the day, it's both a civilian and a government effort. And as civilians, we have a voice that our governments have to listen to. We have to use them, and we have to be working hard on both fronts in order to help Ukraine be victorious. All right. Anyway, uh, where was I? I'm going to end the poll also, <laughs> just because, yeah, it's, it's a hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, let me turn the camera off. And I'll take the mask off. Oh, that's better. All right. Now then, uh, next question we have is from Cheryl Watley. <coughs> is Unilever still in Russia? Uh... As of February 13th, 2023, because they're aware of the fact that they have received scrutiny and the fact that you're asking specifically about this company um, probably shows that they've received some attention on this topic. Um, Unilever made a statement saying, oh, okay, let's take a look at what the statement says. Oh, okay. So their official statement is, we continue to condemn the war in Ukraine as a brutal and senseless act by the Russian state. Since March 2022, we have ceased all... Well, sorry, had a weird audio echo in my headphones for a sec. Uh, we have ceased all imports and exports of our products into and out of Russia, and we have stopped all media... 
and advertising spending. Uh, we have also ceased all capital flows into and out of the country. We continue to supply our everyday food and hygiene products made in Russia to people in the country. So there it is. They're still doing business in Russia. They don't want to say it that way. Um, and then they give all of the, you know, the the politically correct answer of this is horrible. We condemn it. But also we're still doing business, basically. But only a little bit is the way that they're wording it. Um, according to leaverussia.org, and that's leave-russia.org for anyone who wants to see it, um, they are still continuing operations. So, yeah, don't do business with Unilever. Don't buy stuff from them <laughs> is, is my, my opinion. I'm not doing it with Burger King. I'm not doing it with, um, I believe Pepsi also is still in Russia so I haven't been buying Pepsi products. There's, there's, a, there's a couple others. Um, yeah, unfortunately. Thank you for a great question. And with that, let me double check, make sure there's no other questions. See you later. Later, uh, Catalan. Heroim Slava. Yes, I also love this background. <laughs> that that is why I continue to use it. It, um, it is very, uh, it's beautiful and it's also a little mesmerizing. Um, I don't see any other questions immediately. Do smaller, yeah, I've considered doing smaller item raffles, and maybe that would be a good niche, because I tried to do a small one that was a, a red and black sunflower, um, like, tote bag, or, um, uh, the suitcase, suitcase tag, um, and it was pretty nice, um, it had red and black and a sunflower, it's very Ukrainian themed, uh, no one was interested in it when we tried to raffle, uh, auction it over on Rick's channel for like, I think it was 20 bucks was the starting price. Maybe it needed to be lower. Like maybe, maybe, maybe they need to be like starting at $10 or something like that. Um, but yeah, there wasn't much of an interest. So it just, um, I, I just kept it. <laughs> so if we do do auctions i'll probably do a poll first and see you know show people pictures like a list of items and see what people are actually interested in all right all right so anyway uh questions oh we do have a couple questions why are some humans so evil uh, I think it's like asking why are some humans so good? Um, well, first of all, I don't think anyone is really completely evil or completely good. I think everybody's a mix of both, but it is true. There are some people who, by multiple systems and frameworks of morality and ethics, would be considered pretty obscenely evil or, um, well, yeah, just, just horrible human beings. Um, I personally think that it's a combination of nature and nurture. Some people are more naturally prone to certain activities or thought patterns that are, and there's no, I, yeah, yeah. I, I believe that some people are a little more prone to it, but nobody is destined for that. Uh, nurture is a big part of it and the world can be a cruel place. And sometimes a big part of it is that, People who do evil um, or who find that they can break rules or they can uh, be pretty brutal or, or cutthroat, whether it be in the world of business or in the military or whatever field of work it might be, um, politics, uh, get ahead in life. They learn that a pattern that, oh, if I do such and such and i don't get caught or there isn't negative coverage of it i can still amass some power i can get ahead in life and then you see people kind of 
you know, follow and, you know, be drawn into the influence of people like that because, well, humans tend to have admiration and look toward other humans who have influence uh, in one way or another, whether it be following them or just interacting with and uh, um, forming opinions of the work that they do, the things that they do and say. So I, I think that... Uh, yeah, some people are just, I think that some people kind of end up going through the ringer uh, and have enough exposure to the harshness of life as well as the kinds of people who sometimes get ahead in life by doing evil things. And that can create a cycle, kind of a domino effect that leads to, well, leads to the many different conflicts, wars, horrific, you know, war crimes, horrific things that we see. There's no excuse for it. Uh, it's just, yeah, uh, my, my personal opinion is that uh, life shapes us and uh, yeah, uh, some people get molded into a pretty, uh, pretty terrible shape by life. Anyway, thank you for a great question. Um, Red Tyree, any more confirma uh, confirmation in the number of destroyed orc aircraft in the drone attacks on orc air bases? Uh, you mean from that report that I read earlier? Um, if you mean from this week or from last month, I don't have exact numbers. I, I, I did have numbers up, uh, for exact types of aircraft and, uh, what regions they were destroyed in. That was in the, uh, da, da, da. from the Institute for the Study of War, their uh, Russian offensive campaign assessment from April 5th. Uh, if you go take a look at that, it should have some more numbers. If, if you're asking about the usual total numbers, oh, no, 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 you're not talking about total numbers, just in the drone attacks on orc air bases. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't have those numbers right now on me. Um, but if you go check out the Institute for the Study of War, you should find information you're looking for there. Um, from Why Ukraine the Last Alliance, am I going on the shows tonight? Yes, yes I am. And uh, if you're going to be there, I will see you there, man. Um, in fact, tonight, I think we're going to try to do a... I think we're going to try to do a multi-stream. So after this stream is over, I'm going to put... Uh, I'm going to put the update for the fundraiser up immediately because I'm trying to make that a habit from now on. Do it the same day because I'll, I'll get buried in other things that I need to do otherwise. And then it ends up being the middle of the week before it goes up. Um, so I'm going to put the update up for the fundraiser and then I'm got... Um, yeah, and then I'm going to put a notification up about... Uh, about the shills stream and so uh you can watch it on the shills and i encourage everyone to do that uh but we should also have it live here on tridents against tyrants so if you want to watch it from either channel it should be uh should be possible to do so um this will be the first night that we try that out and i also am going to try to do a stream tomorrow with uh yana from Project Constantine. Um, I need to set the exact time with her, but uh, keep a lookout for that as well. Hey everybody. All right, and that should be it for our questions for right now. Oh, yes, and why Ukraine is going to be on. Yeah, everybody, when this stream is over, go check out uh, James at Why Ukraine the Last Alliance because uh, he and I our streams are pretty nicely lined up because I'm pretty sure he goes pretty soon after I finish mine usually so it, it's pretty nice right now on Saturdays you can go from Tridents to Why Ukraine the Last Alliance to the Shills and I'm sure there are others who are also streaming today because um, there's so many of us and sometimes our schedules overlap with one another but um but that's really cool that, you know, those three channels, boom, 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 or 
pretty pretty consistent. All right. Actually, let me take a look at this real fast. And then we're going to move on to the next news. Oh, shoot, is that? Oh, shoot. Actually, it might be... Yeah, I started a little bit late today, everybody. But I think he's actually starting right now. And... Yeah... Yeah. Well, I guess we'll have overlap. So if you guys want to, if you, if you have the ability to do, to do so, feel free to open up a second tab if you're on a computer because, uh, he is starting up very soon. It looks like. Oh, and Anna is also streaming. Nice. All right. In any case, let's move on to the next news. Cause we've got quite a bit and I've only gone through two articles. <coughs> I don't know if we're going to have, <coughs> Excuse me. Time to go through all of them, but we're going to try to get through uh, at least a few more of these. Okay. There we go, and oh. yeah, there we go. All right. Russo-Ukrainian War Day 772. Ukraine's drone strikes inflict damage on Russian air bases, and this is by Euromaidan Press. Putting it in the chat. That's the wrong chat. Here's the right chat. <clears throat> Frontline report. Ukraine repels Russian assault waves in strategic city of Krasnohorivka, Donetsk Oblast. In the Krakove direction, Russian forces have increased the intensity of their attacks toward the Ukrainian town of Krakove and have started a large-scale battle in an attempt to reach it. Ukrainian defenders have successfully repelled three Russian assault waves there. No Russian troops in Klasivyar, Ukraine's armed forces. Ukra uh, Ukrainian command advises not to trust Russian reports. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I agree with that uh, assessment. Um, Ukraine's drone strike destroys <coughs> six aircraft, damages eight at Russia's Morozovsk Air Base. Uh, M.T. Anderson, an OSINT, OSINT, Open Source Intelligence Analyst, estimates that the Morozovsk Air Base might have had up to 30 Russian aircraft on site at the moment of the drone assault. Ukraine downs 13 out of 13 Russian drones in an overnight attack. The Russian military deployed the drones from its bases in occupied Crimea. Russians poised for street battles in Chasivyar, Robotny at risk. Deep State Analysts. Russia's manpower, artillery advantage, and surplus equipment enable multi-front pressure on Ukraine. And drone attacks hit Russian air bases in Morozovsk, Yeysk, and Engels. Local residents reported dozens of explosions on social media, but there is no confirmation of any damage so far. Oh. Actually, this is... Okay, well, this is a lot of stuff, and I think each of these actually link to separate articles. Uh, obviously we're not going to go through all of them, but this is actually a really nice recap of multiple things happening. So, yeah, quick little, um, bite size information for all of you. And if you want to read it, uh, check out the link to go look at any of these topics in depth. But let's take a look. For, all right. On the topic of intelligence and technology. Russia recruits Ukrainians in occupied territories to fight in Africa. Russia's wa oh that that pisses me off. Actually, I'm going to save that article because that is something I will probably try to talk with um with our good friend Yana about um because we've discussed Russian uh activities in South Africa and the rest of the, co the continent. So, damn 
All right, let's see. Russia's Wagner private military company has started a large-scale recruitment of Ukrainians in the temporarily occupied territories. The goal is to provide recruits for Russian influence operations in Africa. That is horrible. That is horrible. So, recruitment, it so <coughs> knowing Russia, it's either going to be a pressure campaign in terms of, quote, recruitment, or just conscription, and they pretend like it's voluntary. Um, and that's not good for multiple reasons, because A, trying to break down the Ukrainian identity, and so, you know, that could be used to say, no, 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 these are Russian recruits, not Ukrainian. Or they can also go the other route, the Russians with information warfare, and start saying, emphasizing that um, the people who they're trying to forcibly, illegally recruit for this kind of work uh, are Ukrainian. And that doesn't give a good name to Ukraine, of course. Now, that wouldn't work because... Obviously, uh, Ukrainian people in government have nothing to do with that, but um, it's, yeah, sorry. I got caught up on that one because it sickens me quite a bit to see that. Anyway, all right, let's see. M uh, from CNN, munition shortages pose dire threat to Ukraine, say Western officials. <coughs> CNN cites Western officials warning of dire consequences for Ukraine due to munition shortages and delayed U.S. aid, putting air defenses at risk amid intensifying Russian attacks. No shit. <laughs> no shit. Congress, send weapons to Ukraine. Full stop. The, 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 yeah. We are all very aware of this. Painfully aware of this. Czechia aims to deliver at least 800,000 ammunition rounds to Ukraine. Yep, we've covered that in the past. As Ukraine grapples with a severe artillery ammunition shortage, Czechia pledges to contribute tens of millions of euros to the ammunition initiative. UK Intel, Russia seized 180 Ukrainian companies worth 11. $5 billion since the invasion. The report also highlights Russia's redistribution of assets to Kremlin-aligned business people who support the war in Ukraine. Uh, screw the Kremlin and Moscovia's uh, mafia, um, mafioso, ma mafia government, and their oligarchs and their war crimes in order to steal wealth to give to oligarchs. Um, and yeah, we need to seize Russian assets abroad. That is my take on that. ISW, from Institute for the Study of War, Kremlin claims NATO and Russia in direct confrontation to deter Western support for Ukraine. The Kremlin has escalated its rhetoric with spokesperson Dmitry Peskov claiming that NATO is already involved in the <coughs> conflict surrounding Ukraine. <coughs> International news. Let's see. There's, a qu there's quite a bit here, so we're not going to go through all the rest of this. Let's see if there's anything <coughs> that really stands out. First, Russian losses as of April 5th, 2024. Approximate losses of weapons and military equipment of the Russian armed forces from the beginning of the invasion to present day. Personnel, 445,900. Slowly getting, yeah, within the next within the next two months, I'm pretty sure we'll see that get up to half a million. Here we go. Uh, tanks, 7,033. APVs, 13,459. <coughs> over 11,000 artillery systems. Over 1,000 MLRS uh, systems. <coughs> uh, hundreds of aircrafts and hel helicopters. A large number of warships and boats. Um, uh, yeah, the Navy, um, Russian Navy has been hurt pretty badly um hmm wow 52 percent hold on percent destroyed from total 47 percent oh active stock reserve on paper <laughs> okay so wow 52 percent of active stock and reserves of russian tanks have 
been estimated to be destroyed. Okay. I guess the estimate here is based off of them having a few less than the Russian Ministry of Defense originally stated, because I'm pretty sure they originally, the Russians were saying they had like 22,000 or 25,000 or something like that. But if this is accurate and it's more like 14 or 15,000 in reality, okay, <coughs> that's pretty damn good. Yeah, keep destroying Russian tanks. Make sure there's none for them to be able to use without bankrupting bankrupting themselves. All right. <clears throat> and on to the next news. And if you want to see the rest of the stuff here, be sure to check out the link. We'll do two more. Oh, here's something directly related, directly related to what we discussed at the very beginning. Um, uh, with Romania. Yeah, let's cover this. This is from Militarni. Putting the link in the chat. <clears throat> a kamikaze drone <coughs> attacked a military unit in the so-called Pridnestrovian Moldovan Republic. Interesting. A crater after the de detonation of a kamikaze drone's warhead. Uh, a kamikaze drone attacked a military unit in the Ribnita district of the unrecognized Pridnestrovian Moldovan Republic. Local media reported on this. The incident reportedly took place yesterday at 2.35 p.m., targeting the only radar in Transnistria, the P-12 Yenisei, which sustained minor damage after the strike. Local residents posted a video showing a drone moving toward the military unit, followed by an explosion. A crater was created at the crash site, and there were no casualties among the personnel. Okay. On March 15th, Milita Militarni reported that a kamikaze drone had attacked a helicopter on the territory of a military unit of the so-called oh, uh, Pridnestrovian Moldovan Republic at the Tiraspol airfield. The drone's flight to the military, military facility <clears throat> was recorded from the side of the road junction, which is locally known as the Cleverni Bridge. The distance from the bridge to the landing <coughs> side of the Transnistrian... <coughs> Armed groups is about six kilometers. Debris of the destroyed MI-8 of the so-called Pridnestrovian Moldovan Republic. Okay. According to the wreckage characteristics, the drone hit a hel helicopter that was equipped with unguided missiles. Local telegram channels report that the incident occurred at around 12.10 p.m., a video capturing a helicopter being hit by a small drone that looks like an FPV was also released. Oh, is this not going to... Oh, shoot. Hold on, let me see if I can get this to where you guys can read. Oh, dang. Nope. I'm trying to get it up. Oh. Mm, that's annoying. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> no casualties have been reported as a result of the hit, and the relevant emergency services immediately arrived at the scene. So, uh, you can see why uh, Transnistria could be a small flashpoint. And so... Uh, Moldova may see conflict in the years to come. Um, probably the two most likely countries to see some kind of conflict, I would say, unfortunately, are Moldova and, well, mm, no, the three most likely, I would say, are Republic of Georgia, Moldova, and Bosnia-Herzegovina, in that order. I don't think Kosovo will see anything anytime too soon. But those three in Europe are, yeah, situation internally and with outside relations, it's, it definitely looks a little dicey. Uh, oh, and I forgot to put the article. Sorry. There you go. So, um, yeah, very important to note, everybody, don't forget about Moldova because uh, it is right next to Ukraine. It is part of Europe, and it very much could 
expand into something new. All right. Hmm. Thank you for your service in Iraq, Reb Tyree. And yeah, you're right. It is heartbreaking what's happening in Ukraine. All right. <clears throat> Next article real fast. So we're going to talk, oh wow, quite a bit of extra info here. Okay. All right, yeah, we're not going to have time to get through every single thing, but there's a lot of good information here. Um, all right. So anything we don't have time to get to today, you know what? I'm just going to put all the links in the chat so everybody can go... <coughs> take a look at them because uh, I don't want them to not be presented to everybody. Uh, I guess we'll do one more article because it is approaching two hours and I do have a few other appointments I need to get to. But um, I think that this is pretty important to cover. <clears throat> and I'm a little... Um, Hmm. I'm a little wary about it because it involves Turkey, but let's take a look. But it also makes sense because Turkey does have beef with Russia. And if there's any reason why Russia wouldn't invade Republic of Georgia, it's not because of the rest of NATO. It's not because of Europe, because Ukraine kind of proves that you're not going to see troops on the ground <coughs> from those countries, unfortunately. If there's any country that's going to de <coughs> deter uh, a Russian invasion of Georgia, it's Turkey. Specifically because they wouldn't like to have Russian troops on their border. And I think that's probably about the only reason why, sadly. Um, all right. So, moving this over, this is from ednews.net, come on, there it is, there it is. Yes. Yeah, about making sure that munitions are available for Ukraine, yes. And and that is important. And uh, you have to do business and make choices in order to get things, you know, that, that are needed, like munitions for Ukraine. Um, I have a trust issue with Turkey when it comes to quite a few different things. <coughs> but at the end of the day, if they're willing to provide munitions to Ukraine then that could be a route to take. So let's read up on this right now. <coughs> Turkey joins NATO allies in suspending Europe arms treaty. Um, Turkey suspended an arms treaty that imposed limits on conventional military equipment in Europe, joining NATO allies who did the same after Russia withdrew from the agreement last year, ED News reports, citing Bloomberg. Uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan signed a decree suspending Turkey's obligations under the Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces in Europe, which was originally concluded during the Cold War from April 8th. <coughs> Wait. Hmm. Hold on a sec. Is that it? Yeah. Very short. Okay. Uh, oh. Hold on. All right, let me pull up the rest of this. All 
All right. Well, this is also related to the situation regarding Turkey. Uh, some information. Here we go. From armyrecognition.com. Oh, come on. Load. Bypassing the EU blockade, U.S. partners with Turkey for, here we go, for 155 millimeter munitions to Ukraine. Defense News, April 2020, 2024, Global Security Army Industry, Defense Security Global News. Here we go. The United States has announced a partnership with Turkey for the supply of 155 millimeter munitions to Ukraine. Faced with an increasing shortage in their military stocks, exacerbated by their substantial assistance to Ukraine, the United States has turned to Turkey for the purchase of munitions, specifically 155 millimeter caliber artillery shells. <clears throat> this decision reflects a, pr a preference <coughs> for Turkish productions recognized for their compliance with NATO standards, a key <coughs> criterion to ensure interoperability within the alliance, especially since some European countries had shown their disagreement with the purchase of Turkish munitions. <coughs> <coughs> that fact is not surprising at all. Uh, for anyone who's unaware, Turkey does still have a nominally secular democratic government, but uh, nominally being the key word there. Oh, here we go. Um, there's a trust issue with Turkey because there is a legitimate concern that it is going down a, a an authoritarian path with a capable military and um, ambitions to start its own wars uh, with certain other countries um not related to ukraine uh or russia just their own machinations and uh so it's kind of a give and take it's kind of do i want to buy from do i want to do business with this dictator today in order to stop the war that's happening now and by doing so uh basically sow the seeds of another war tomorrow so yeah that, that's why it's a rather potentially bittersweet um but at the same time turkey is an important part of the nato alliance and it's not just erdogan and his party there is opposition and they aren't completely without influence so who knows hopefully turkey will hopefully turkey will have a bit of uh a political and social renaissance, so to speak. Uh, I'm not holding my breath, but hopefully things improve. <clears throat> the United States has announced a partnership with Turkey. Da, 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 da. Ah. So here are a few examples of the 155 millimeter shells in multiple colors, apparently. MKE manufactures several types of 155 millimeter rounds under a cooperation agreement with the Turkish state company Roketstan and the defense branch Sage of the Turkish government research agency Tubitak. <clears throat> this transaction has proven all the more significant as it comes in a context where certain European countries, notably Greece, Cyprus, and France, have expressed reluctance to finance the acquisition of Turkish munitions intended for Ukraine. Yeah, Gre Greece and Cyprus... No surprise there, because they are on the list of countries that may experience conflict, war with, wh whether it be hybrid war or cold war, hybrid war, uh, direct open hot war, open conflict, whatever the case might be with Turkey. France has had issues with Turkey, and uh, more specifically, uh, France is currently, for anyone who's unaware, <clears throat> more deeply assisting Armenia in their defense, which Turkey doesn't like because Turkey does, under current leadership, under current military and political leadership, unfortunately, have a vision of, of invading Armenia, most likely. Yeah, 
I don't believe that they have an official policy because if they did, then the entire world would be calling it out constantly. But there's already been a war and there's still tension even after taking, even after, you know, the war resulted in a loss on Armenia's side and territory basically being you know, taken back or taken because it's gone back and forth several times through history, um, taken by Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is a close ally of Turkey, and the two, for lack of a better... <coughs> okay, I'm, go I'm going down a rabbit hole, but ba the basic way I can put it to you is like this. The current president of Turkey has a certain philosophy of uh, Turkish global... Um, not hegemony, but uh, it, it's it's kind of like, you know, the idea of, quote, Ruski Mir that Putin has, where it's like, uh, bring together and, you know, basically under one banner, all of the ethnic Russian people of the world, whatever country they live in, there's, there's one, quote, Russian world. There's kind of a similar idea with Turkish world, one might say. And, uh... Many Azeris from Azerbaijan identify as Turkish. So there's kind of this Armenia is in the way. If we could just bulldoze through there, we could have our countries actually touch one another and uh kind of like a kind of like a Russia Belarus thing where we're not officially the same country, but we could form like a confederation like a a federation, federal entity, or something like that, where we're separate but still integrated on certain things and work together and, you know, build our militaries up together, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Anyway, back to Ukraine. Uh, Greece and Cyprus have that, that kind of grievance as well as other places like Armenia. And France just has political and counterintelligence operations that uh, go against the ambitions of the Turkish state. Um, now then, these countries blocked a financing proposal with European funds despite the major majority support of EU member states. This opposition has highlighted a divergence in approaches between the European Union and the United States in military... Oh! Oh, wow! Wow! Somebody... Okay, I just saw the progress bar. Thank you very much, Nikki, for letting me know. Um, I don't know who did that just now, but someone just brought us up by 39,000 hrivna, everybody. And that's, that's pretty good. That's very good. Thank you very much. Uh, that is... Yeah, that's, that's $1,005. Uh, yeah. So... Over a thousand bucks in one donation. Thank you very much. Um, man, that really does help. Thank you very much. That that right there is like either two drones or almost two drones right there, guys. So um, I don't know if that was one person or multiple donations at once, because if it was PayPal or Monobank, I can't I can't see that right here. But um, either way, thank you very much. Slava Ukraini. I was worried I was going off too much about Turkey, but apparently someone liked what I was saying. Um, so I, I'm glad I went on a short rant. <laughs> um, all right. Let's see. Um, all right, let's, let's finish out this, <clears throat> this article. Um, these countries blocked a financing proposal with European funds. Despite the majority support of EU member states, this opposition has highlighted a divergence in approaches between the European Union and the United States in military support for Ukraine. The United States has thus acquired 116,000 artillery shells from a Turkish company. And also, I do want to highlight the fact that it, it shows a divergence in approaches. Um... The U.S. would be, if it weren't for internal political dysfunction, which is just a sad reality, the U.S. would be sending supplies right now. 
So w what's most frustrating is this is basically a way to get around the fact that majority in the U.S. want to send, but a minority are using the spoiler effect to prevent it from being possible under democratic laws. It, it, because it, the U.S. is a democratic republic. And unfortunately, in this situation, the, the rules just say that... Well, actually, there <clears throat> probably is a way to get around the current issues with con <coughs> Congress, but it could cost the election, and that could cause Donald Trump to end up stealing the election, and that could result in a lot more problems for people. So you see a lot of political fear, which really frustrates me in Washington, D.C. right now. Um, in Europe, kind of similar situation. You see countries that have... <coughs> that are giving what they can to Ukraine, but it's just not enough. Turkey can help to fill that gap. So it's kind of a rock in a hard place emergency situation. And this is also part of the reason why the U.S. and other countries don't fully call <coughs> Turkey out on all of the stuff happening, all the shit happening there, because they do actually play this, this role of the middleman where, hey, when everything else you know, the political realities of your countries get in the way, maybe you can broker a deal with Turkey. And so, yeah, it's a, yeah, it, it's a real, uh, not catch 22, but it, it is a, a dilemma, um, where there aren't good choices. The, the choices are wait and see if you have a breakthrough to send your own stuff, which sounds insane, but that's, that's where it's at. Or, find someone else who can send it. Well, let's read on. Um, the United States has thus acquired 116,000 artillery shells from a Turkish company with prospects for <coughs> additional purchases beyond the shells. The United States also sources trinitroluene, <coughs> tri TNT, <coughs> and nitroguanidine, used respectively in the manufacture and munition of munitions and as a propellant for shells from Turkey. The Turkish state-owned corporation, Mechanical and Chemical Industry Corporation, MKE, holds a near monopoly on the production of 155 millimeter shells, and the quantities it produces are kept confidential. MKE manufactures several types of 155 millimeter rounds under a cooperation agreement with the Turkish state company, Roketsan, and the defense branch, Sage of the Turkish Government Research Agency, Tubitak. The Turkish Armed Forces also heavily used the 155 millimeter rounds in their T-155 Firtina Howitz in their cross-border operations in Syria and Iraq. Furthermore, the collaboration between <coughs> the two countries extends beyond commercial exchanges. The United States plans to establish three munitions production lines in Texas, aiming to meet the needs of both its military and those of Ukraine. This initiative underscores the American commitment to supporting Ukraine while enhancing its munitions production capability. Capability. The production lines from the Turkish defense company Repcon are expected to produce about 30% of all 155mm artillery shells manufactured in the United States by 2025. All right. So, yeah. Uh, hmm. Wow. I'm just... I am just realizing I was speaking with someone, uh, not at a conference, just at a... a, a kind of a, an informal meeting of minds. We were at a pub. Um, when I was traveling not too long ago, uh, out in the Maryland area, not too far from DC, and this person happens to be from Texas, and they were telling me about their time in Texas working for a particular billionaire who I won't name drop. Um, and the number of foreign dignitaries, and specifically from Turkey, that they would speak with. So, so this isn't something that surprises me too much. This is something that, uh, it, it, these are business ties that have existed for a while, I guess, is something that I had recently learned when I spoke with them. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. The relationship between the U.S. and Turkey, sometimes strained in the past, appears to be rapidly improving. Turkey recently approved Sweden's NATO membership 
And the United States has progressed in the process of Turkey acquiring Block 70 F-16 jets and <coughs> upgrade kits following Ankara's request in October 2021 after being removed from the F-35 jet program. My guess is that the F-16, <coughs> as iconic a name as it is and as great a system as it is, is finally getting to the point where the U.S. is feeling confident enough, confident enough to say, um, okay, we, we've got newer models that are better, that are going to outclass the F-16 in the next few generations. Maybe the, you know, yeah. So there's a little bit, a little bit less hesitance to uh, less hesitation, I should say, to uh, provide other countries with the F-16 model uh, fighter jet. But it is still a pretty useful fighter jet. I mean, if you want an example of air superiority and technology, you know, outclassing many, many other pieces of military hardware from multiple attacking countries, multiple assailants. Uh, look at examples of Israel, its wars with its neighbors from a few decades ago, um, like the Yom Kippur War, for example. Um, the, uh, the, the, there's, yeah. Um, my point being, even though it's old technology, it's good technology. So, hmm. Yeah, regardless, um, it, it is good to see that munitions can be made available to Ukraine and possibly also fill the gap that is needed in the U.S. Because we are well beyond just a Cold War right now, everybody. But regardless, even though there are active wars happening, there is still a very real Cold War. And the U.S. needs to, and Europe, both need to up their military spending and production capabilities. It should be like World War II right now, guys. We should be making more factories. We should be preparing more. We should be looking toward a future where there's, there's going to be more conflict between authoritarian and liberal democratic um, governments and entities around the world. All right. The scheduled <clears throat> meeting on May 9th between Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his American counterpart Joe Biden at the White House highlights the importance of this bilateral uh, relationship, <coughs> both militarily and diplomatically, in the current context of geopolitical tensions and support for Ukraine. This collaboration between the United States and Turkey emphasizes the latter's importance as a key player in the production and export of munitions capable of meeting NATO quality and compatibility requirements while offering a viable alternative to the limitations encountered by European countries in military support for Ukraine. So when you're in a tough situation, you sometimes have to make tough choices. So am I completely happy about this? Not entirely, but I, I am happy if Ukraine gets what it needs. Because at the end of the day, for those who are in positions of leadership making these decisions, you have to be careful not to create bigger problems for yourself in the future. But these are the hard decisions you have to make sometimes. More than sometimes. A lot of the time. Sadly. All right. Let's see. I'm going to check chat and Q&A real fast. Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's another good question. <clears throat> They're talking about acquiring the shells from Turkey, but what what's the authorization <clears throat> authorization process going to look like to actually get them into Ukrainian hands? It would make more sense to give the money to Ukraine and have Ukraine purchase them directly, I would think. But I guess Turkey doesn't want to piss off Russia too much by giving directly to Ukraine. But they're giving to the U.S., so I think that would still piss Russia off pretty equally. Uh, it's not going to make Russia happy regardless. So, so yeah, um, we'll see how things go. All right. Oh, I almost forgot. I'm going to put <coughs> a link to James' stream on why you... <coughs> 
why Ukraine the last alliance because he is live right now everybody um so go check him out as well okay and what I'm gonna do now because <coughs> I spent too much time doing geopolitical analysis uh, we aren't going to have time to go over every single piece of news, but I am going to put a couple of these links in the chat so you guys can go take a look at some of these articles if you find them interesting. So one sec while I do that. Yeah, there are a lot of them for Militarni. <laughs> uh, what else have we got here? Oh. Oh, okay. All right, let me share these last couple of things and links and we're gonna we're gonna do one more piece of news um cover one more piece of news that uh is very important oh the progress bar updated again someone sent another twenty thousand trivna that so that i think that's a that should be approximately five hundred dollars or so let me double check five hundred and fifteen dollars <coughs> 73 cents US. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, man, thank you very much. Seriously, like, okay, man. Thank you a lot, guys, because, I mean, we have been fundraising every week, and I'm always grateful for, you know, one stream, maybe it's like 200 bucks, another it's five or 600, but this is extremely generous and and we do have a law a large fundraiser uh i'm very happy about the fact that we're as we're withdrawing funds and buying more of the, the drones we're getting to a point where like donations of 500 or a thousand bucks actually are you know making it go up one two three percent uh you know slowly it, it's getting there and eventually we'll get to the point where like <coughs> one or 200 bucks, you know, or, or so is <clears throat> bringing the percentage bar up pretty visually. Um, and, and I know that's something that everybody would like to see. Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart because yeah, um, it shows that people do care about Ukraine. Um, I've done it myself. I've dropped you know, a few grand or a few hundred bucks when I'm able to with different fundraising <coughs> campaigns. And it does make a difference. It does save lives. Some of the equipment that we sent when they were doing the evacuation from Avdivka, guys, it was really important. They needed to have it to prevent their vehicles. If you guys remember, we did an announcement about it where some of the equipment was used for devices to help prevent enemy drones from being able to zero in on Ukrainian vehicles. Basically, it was electronic warfare defensive equipment protection for the, their evacuation vehicles. Stuff like that makes a difference. <coughs> sometimes maybe you're saving one or two lives. Sometimes you're saving, you know, uh, an entire unit or, or an entire platoon. You know, it, it could be dozens of li <coughs> lives... <coughs> It could be more than that, you know? Um, so, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and what I mentioned before, that was for... Because if you remember, we had two bars. We finished one fundraiser for the 
anti-drone guns, and we got those drone guns to them. But then the additional funds that were going to be used for batteries and other extra equipment wound up being used to get some of those devices for vehicles. This fundraiser is exclusively for FPV drones, just to make that clear. Oh, man. Well, this has been... This has been really good. I'm, I'm glad I stayed on a little bit longer. And Oh, and I see a you are welcome. And I see, oh man. Okay, so on my computer, it doesn't show properly. U-A-C-H-U-A, -U -A, and I think that's going to be C-H for Switzerland. So... And I see your profile pic, which is half the Swiss flag and half the Ukrainian flag. So thank you very much, my friend. Um, we all appreciate it. We're all doing everything that we can from all around the world. And you're gener it, 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 yeah, if you made that donation, either one of them or both of them, whatever the case might be, thank you very much. And we went up again, guys. Wow, I was going to end the stream, but now I now I think I should stay on for a little bit longer. <laughs> wow. Thank you very, very much. Hold on, I have to... Is my phone still dead? Shoot. Okay, hold on. I have to open my messengers on my computer now, because I usually have my phone with me. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Anton know, because I think he's still here with us, but it's late, so he might be asleep. Um, and yeah, this, this will make his day. Thank you, everybody. And I do see the, do I, okay, no, Anton is awake and he is with us and I do see the message, um, yeah, about the donations. So I'm not going to name drop because I don't know who does or does not want to be anonymous. I will just read. Oh, okay, well, this one is not anonymous. It's got a name on it. Thank you to Amonsky for making a donation. Uh, 31 US dollars for the 110th Brigade. Thank you very much, my friend. Uh, what else do I see here? Hey, and if, if I don't see yours here, uh, I do apologize. Um, but uh, any that I do see that are sent to me, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and mention right quick. From... I'm just, uh, doesn't say if they want to be anonymous or not, so I won't mention the name, but, uh, $25 for the 110th, uh, and we'll just say from Jay, uh, thank you very much. Actually, first names are probably fine as long as I don't mention last names, but also I know that some people use usernames. And don't realize or forget that when they make a PayPal donation, it uses their real name. So I, so I still don't know if first names are okay. So we'll just say J for that one. Thank you very much. From Amonsky, the 31, thank you again. Uh, let's see here. Oh, wow. Wait, this, I can't tell if it's Hrivna or... No, this must be Hrivna. Um, because... Yeah, it would be too large an amount otherwise. Um, so 1,020 Hrivna from CF Beauty. And from... Uh, <coughs> uh, from... Uh, we'll just say R. Uh, 2,000 Hrivna. Thank you to both of you very much. And those were via Monobank. And here we go, um, 1,000 from Adrian, Drones for the Heroes from Adrian. Thank you immensely. All right, and we are continuing onward a little bit more <laughs> before we close out the stream. Ah. <sighs> Oh, thank you guys. It's been a it's been a little bit of a rough week, so this this also makes me pretty happy to see.
And we're going to, uh, the funds that were withdrawn, because you'll notice we started at like 30 hryvna because we had withdrawn the funds for the next batch of uh, drones. We're going to have those pictures and updates ready for you very soon. And I'll post them up on the channel and on the Discord. All right, no new questions. Oh man, it's already about to be one. And I think, hold on, I have to check on something. All right, yeah, we're going to end here in a few minutes because we're going to have a call campaign to representatives in the US and the EU. But let's see here. Um, the last piece of news that I want to. <coughs> excuse me, that I want to cover before we end the stream. Um, let's see. Here's how we're going to do this. I'm just going to post a few more links for different news that people might want to see. So you guys can check them out on your own time because we don't have time to go over them right now. Um, these are related to different viewpoints of the U.S. House on voting to help Ukraine. Most are from Axios.com. Oh, and this is an important link. GOP, uh, I know that a lot of people are not big fans of the Republican Party in the U.S. right now. Uh, but there is a group, and remember, bipartisan support is important. Support for Ukraine is important, okay, regardless of party lines. There's a group called GOP4Ukraine.com, the Ukraine report card. Many of you have probably already seen it. Um, yeah, definitely check that out. It's got important information about um, different Republicans and how they have voted related to a, a support for Ukraine. Uh, so it'll give you an idea of those who have and have not shown support for Ukraine the way they voted and spoken in the past. Yes, I'll be sure to send you that in just a bit, Dick. Uh, cause, oh man, yeah, we're already, we're going to be on in like an hour. Oh man. Okay. Uh, let me get all of this done. So this is the last article I want to cover and then we're going to end the stream. So, this is related to a pro-Ukraine group in the United States that is working on a billboard campaign in support of, uh, of the country, in support of Ukraine's efforts to defend their sovereignty, freedom, and really just the lives of their people, their livelihoods. Uh, here we go. <clears throat> Exclusive, and author is Andrew Solender. Exclusive, Republicans to face pro-Ukraine deluge on return to DC. And here you see a graphic, one of their, one of their signs, billboards. Uh, it reads, I'm a Republican, I support Ukraine, don't let Putin win. Um, and then it has the person's name, Republican voter. Can't quite make it out from here. Uh, but yeah, fantastic work. Republican lawmakers returning to D.C. next week will be hounded at every turn with reminders of the pressure they face to pass aid for Ukraine, Axios has learned. Why it matters. House Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican of Louisiana, and a Brief reminder that the Port of New Orleans is opening a new trade deal, working on a new trade deal with the Port of Odessa. So, uh, Mike Johnson, if you're listening, uh, your state is opening up more to trade and cooperation with Ukraine. So, yeah, keep that in mind. Has sign signaled that the coming weeks will be a make-or-break period on Ukraine. 
and other foreign aid funding. Driving the news. Pro-Ukraine conservative group Republicans for Ukraine is launching a six-figure billboard campaign, according to plans first shared with Axios. The mobile billboards highlight pro-Ukraine Republican voters with the message, we're Republicans, we support Ukraine, don't let Putin win. The billboards will be stationed at Reagan National Airport as lawmakers fly into D.C. on April 7th and 8th, as well as as well as at bus stops and circling the Capitol. And guys, <coughs> there are a lot of independents and Democrats and nonpartisan uh, folks in the United States who support Ukraine, of course, because, I mean, I think a lot of the people here in this chat probably fall into nonpartisan, I don't have a party, or liberal-leaning, or Democrat, etc. But we also have people here, I'm sure, who are more right-leaning on certain topics, or even are Republicans. Um, so I really want to see a Democrats for Ukraine organization, because it feels almost like, or, or even just American, <coughs> there's... <coughs> There are groups like the American Coalition for Ukraine where your political party, it doesn't matter. Um, but if you've got a group of Republicans openly saying this because they know that the assumption is their party is the problem blocking aid to Ukraine, they're making a statement, they're making it clear, nah, we're not going to accept this. I want to see more from Democrats because, because yeah, um, majority of Democrats have been highly supportive but it would be good to see a formal organization, a, I don't know, a 501c3 or 501c4, some organization um, doing similar work to this. And also maybe calling out the few Democrats who haven't been in support of Ukraine because there are a handful. There are a handful for a couple of different reasons. So anyway, this is good to see. And I hope we see more like it. I see we. I hope we see more organizations like this as well. Um, the mobile billboards. Da, 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 the billboards will be. Uh, yeah, what they're saying. Most House Republicans know that helping Ukraine is the right thing to do, but they've chosen to stay silent and ignore the problem. Said Republicans for Ukraine spokesperson Gunnar Raymer. That means further loss of life in Ukraine and more leeway for Putin to act with impunity which emboldens America's adversaries like China, Iran, and North Korea. Precisely. The backdrop. The group, which keeps a report card tracking House Republicans' votes and statements on Ukraine, has run several ad campaigns pressing Republicans to support Ukraine aid. In February, it ran ads in the districts of 10 pro-Ukraine House Republicans, urging them to sign on to Democrats' discharge petition to force a vote on the Senate's $95 billion Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan aid package. Zoom out. Johnson has said that he plans to have the House vote on both Ukraine and Israel aid in some form when the House returns. He has floated several ideas aimed at making Ukraine aid more palatable to Republicans, such as structuring it as a loan and attaching legislation to reverse the Biden administration's pause on liquefied natural gas exports. But Democrats have scoffed at those proposals, with some even pushing for additional humanitarian aid to be added to the package. Uh, it, yeah, so... I've heard mixed opinions on this idea uh, of making it a loan um, to make it palatable to Republicans. Um, the pa uh, re Reversing the pause on liquefied natural gas exports. <coughs> if I'm not mistaken, hold on. Was that pause? Now, I need to actually brush up on this. If that pause is just in general from all, from, from all, many different countries abroad, um then okay i guess that's that's one thing if it's specifically russia and russian natural gas then that does not get reversed and let's be honest here with the way that russia is desperately trying to find ways to make as much money as they can and sell their oil and gas because that's you know fueling their war machine uh the last thing the united states needs is to be buying more when russia is somehow poking their own business interests into it, maybe going through third-party countries um, and hoping that nobody notices. So, yeah, I definitely I need to learn more about that, but just 
from the initial impression doesn't sound like no doesn't sound like a good idea in my mind at least um by the numbers any ukraine aid package will almost certainly need the support of most house democrats and a sizable chunk of republicans a sign of withering gop support for ukraine 104 house republicans voted in september in september to quash 300 million <coughs> in dollars in aid to Ukraine with 117 voting to keep the funding. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia has gone so far as to threaten a vote to remove Johnson should he hold a vote on Ukraine aid. Yeah, Marjorie Trader Greene. Yeah. NBC polling in November found that 55% of voters support sending up oh, Rob Tyree Five coffees, please accept this small donation for the 110th drone fundraiser. Glory and victory for Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Heroim Slava. Thank you very much, Reb. And uh, also, that's yeah, that was the first uh, buy me a coffee um, donation, I think, of the day. Uh, so, quick reminder to everybody. The yellow buy me a coffee is support for soldiers. And each coffee... So when you see five coffees on there... Uh, each is five dollars, so that's that. That should have been twenty-five U.S. dollars just now in donation. Thank you very much, Reb. And with the blue one, that one doesn't. That one is for support of the channel. Um, and oh, I guess I have that turned off right now. I turned it off for the news. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, that that one is simpler. Instead of coffees, it's buying tridents, and each trident is one dollar. Um, please give to the yellow. Buy me a coffee before the blue one. Uh. Uh, I do appreciate receiving support for the channel, um, but uh, I, I want uh, donations to go to soldiers first. And that's why I have them both separated. So people who like what I do, they can support me and the channel and growing the channel, but that is distinct and easily recognizable as different from all the other donation forms which, which go to helping soldiers. Anyway. All right. Um, NBC polling in November found that fifty-five uh, that fifty-five percent of voters support sending more aid to Ukraine, including thirty-five percent of Republicans. Though an AP poll in February found that just fourteen percent of Republicans believe the U.S. is sen is sending too little aid to Ukraine. Uh, wait. Oh, and this is also <coughs> this seems to also be related. Remember that. It's all interconnected, so issues relating to Israel are uh, having an effect on aid to Ukraine. White House temperature is very high at, uh, ahead of Biden BB call, BB being a nickname for Benjamin Netanyahu, the, uh, um, the prime minister in Israel. Oh, shit. Sorry about that. U.S. President Joe Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Tel Aviv on October 18th, 2023. Uh, photo by Miriam Alster via Getty Images. President Biden's phone call with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu planned for Thursday morning is expected to be dead. <coughs> Ten says Biden is outraged about the killing of seven World Central Kitchen aid workers in an Israeli airstrike in Gaza earlier this week. Four U.S. officials said why it matters. Chef Jose Andres, who established the organization, is not <coughs> only a highly respected Washington personality, but also a longtime Biden supporter who the president knows personally. So there, there's that personal touch, but also just in general, remember, guys, we, we don't talk about it a whole lot. Because our focus is on Ukraine, and also because, I'll, just to be blunt, the entire situation with Israel-Palestine is very long and complex, and uh, it's one I have my opinions on, and my opinions are usually ones that neither side wants to hear, <laughs> uh, which saddens me. Um, but regardless, uh, it, we have to talk about it. It is important because this is a conflict that indirectly does affect aid to Ukraine being delivered. Um, so, yeah, uh, hopefully this can be politically navigated in a way that, uh, that proves beneficial to Ukraine in the war effort. All right. Now then, that's... <coughs> so that was the last article. Let me go ahead and 
turn this off because I got to get going here in a sec. There you are. All right. Let me. Oh, wow. And that. OK. And I did confirm that um, the other thousand that was sent was also from Adrian. So thank you very much, Adrian. 2000 right there. That is extremely generous of you. Extremely generous. So thank you very much, my friend. That, uh, that, yeah. Like, yeah. We're all doing everything we can. And, you know, we, when we're able to, all of us give what we can, whether it's 20 bucks, 200, 2000. Um, I remember the, lo the largest amount I've ever seen someone give the most, I think the most I've ever given was a little more, a little more than a thousand in one donation at, at once. Um, but, uh, a while back earlier on in the war, um, I remember over on Rick's stream, we had one person who for one of his truck campaigns donated like 10,000 I think in one stream and that was mind blowing um so yeah it's highly appreciated uh the the th thank you Adrian very much thank you to everyone who has donated today and also uh let's see let's see let's see what else have we got? Shoot, I need my phone. Hold on one sec, I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So, yeah. Uh, in the past, I've been able to do larger, like a couple hundred or a couple grand in donations. Right now, uh, I'm personally not able to do, to do that, but I can still make my donation, and I'm going to do it right now, which is why I <coughs> needed my phone. It makes it a lot easier. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that right now. One sec. And I guess I, I could do it over Buy Me a Coffee, but I, I always do it over PayPal because um, Buy Me a Coffee is great. And I know some people can't use PayPal um, or Monobank. So Buy Me a Coffee is the only option that they have to donate. Um, I always use PayPal because the fees are lower. Uh, so more of your money goes through without being having fees subtracted compared to Buy Me a Coffee. Okay, there we go. And I just made my donation. All right. Okay, guys. And with that, we're two and a half hours in. Uh, the stream <coughs> actually went a little, little longer than I expected it to because um, I, I started a little bit late this morning because uh, I was up late working on on a few other things um, yesterday. Um. So I'm going to go ahead and close everything out. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for standing with Ukraine. Uh, if you haven't already, go check out James. He is, is he, I think he's still, yep, he is still live. 
Um, so go check out James on his stream. And um, be sure to come check us out on The Shills in, oh man, like 45 minutes, I think. Let me double check. Hold on. I'm just running from one thing to another. That's, that's the story of my life, guys. Like, if you ever wonder why sometimes it seems like uh, I'm in such a hurry or why people say, man, we need to get you a secretary, it's because my life is just a constant series of running from one appointment to another. <laughs> Uh, let me see. E yes, that'll be in 45 minutes. So, share. I'm going to put that in chat right now. Oh, and don't forget that, oh man, I really, <coughs> all right, yeah, I gotta go. I really gotta get this ready. So uh, remember that the show stream will be running as usual, and we may also be streaming, uh, multi-streaming. So it might be here on the Tridents channel as well. So keep a lookout for that. All right, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thank you for standing with Ukraine. Thank you very much to everybody who... Uh, donated and showed their support today. Special thanks to Adrian. Um, and yeah, see you guys next week. Oh, and also we might, we're probably gonna have a stream tomorrow with Yana from uh, Project Constantine. So keep an eye out for that. All right. Bye everybody. Slava Ukraini. <laughs>